Awesome. Cool. I think we can get started then. Um, so thank you all for coming. Um, me and Winona are going to be talking today about uh, building internal platforms on most cluster Kubernetes. Um, so before we get started, I think I uh, want to give a brief history around how we got to internal platforms today and platform engineering as a whole. Uh, so as many of you are probably familiar with, way back when there used to be the separation of dev and ops. So you'd have your developer teams writing code and throwing it over the wall to the operations teams who would then package it, ship it, deploy it, and operate it. And this caused a lot of friction. I think it's really well documented all the pains that this method had. Um, low, low release cycles, very buggy software, and just overall not a great experience. Um, so that saw the rise of DevOps. So all of a sudden, the application teams are working collaboratively with the operation teams throughout the entire process. So they were making sure that they were always uh, working together to build, test, ship, and operate the software. And I think everybody generally agrees that this has led to quite a good uh, a good outcome, you know, the software is more reliable, it's getting released more frequently, um, and just overall there's less friction within the organization. Um, but with this, every application team has had to have um, a bit of a higher cognitive load. All of a sudden, the application teams are starting to have to manage all the services that they need in order to test and build their applications. So an application team might now need a CI CD, for example, um, they might need a database, they might need a cache, all these different services they need to um, go about their day to day lives of developing the application. Um, and when you have an organization with tens or hundreds of application teams, what you end up with is all these applica application teams doing a lot of duplication of effort, right? You might have 10, 20 teams that all need the same CI, CD, or they all need a Redis or a Postgres, um, and they all have to go figure out how to do that themselves. So what that's led to is the rise of platform engineering teams. So uh, platform engineering teams go by many names in many organizations. A lot of organizations might not realize they have platform engineering teams. But any team that's there to help reduce the cognitive load for the application teams is essentially a platform team. So in the simplest scenario, it might be a platform team that just manage a centralized um, CI CD system, and then every application team can come and use that CI CD system. Or it might be a GitHub repository that contains a set of Terraform templates that all of the teams can use. Um, or it could be more advanced. It could be something like an, a platform team that can create developer environments for you that are pre-provisioned with some services that you might need. Um, and overall, it's been a really valuable way of reducing the cognitive load for the application developers. So what I'm going to talk about is a few trends of how we've seen people do platform engineering in the industry. Um, the first one I want to talk about is the ticket space approach. Um, so this might be a scenario where, in your organization, the application teams might go to the platform team, fill out a ticket. It could be on Jira, it could be a GitHub issue, it could be any sort of form around what they need from their platform team. So I need a Redis for this configuration, or I just need a Postgres, or a CI CD, or whatever. And the platform team will take that request, manually take it, read it, fulfill it, maybe have a bit of back and forth conversation with the application teams. And while what the application teams are getting back is a highly customized set of services that they have you know, been able to put their footprint on it, and the platform team has also been able to put their footprint on it as well, maybe they care about the governance and security of what's getting deployed, making sure it's all up to date. Um, it's quite a slow process, right? You're going back and forth between two, two humans. It's not on demand. It's not self-service. Um, it's quite a slow turnaround. So there's a lot of drawbacks to this approach. Another approach we see quite a lot is just handing application teams cloud accounts. So you might just say, here's the credentials to GCP. Go get all the services that you need. Um, and from an application team's point of view, this is nice in that I can immediately get whatever I need whenever I need it. I can just go to the cloud and provision an RDS if I need a database. Um, but all of a sudden, these databases and these services that I'm provisioning in the cloud aren't customized for my organization's needs. Um, and the platform team has no way of making sure that you're being compliant with things like security standards or um, all the other concerns they might have. So another common approach we see is just handing uh, application teams Kubernetes clusters. It could be a namespace, it could be a whole cluster. And just saying, here you go, use Kubernetes, just deploy all the services you need on that. On that. Um, and while this is nice because the Kubernetes API is a pretty good and consistent experience, it hasn't really addressed the problem. Um, you're still having, still having all your application teams go to Kubernetes and deploy the stack for all the stuff they need for testing um, or everything they need for their DevOps lifecycle. And it's just basically just reducing the scope of how they're deploying their services. That's all it's really doing. And finally, we see a lot of templates um, being handed down from the platform team to the application team. So this could be Terraform templates, could be Helm charts, could be bash scripts. Um, and this is nice in the sense that the platform team can write something that is customized, could be quite high level, 
um, and they just hand it over to them. And they know that from the platform team's point of view, I've got my business organization needs and embodied in those templates. So like in Terraform, it could be I have the right files, my database, all this sort of stuff. Um, but now you're sort of back to the reverse of the dev and ops that we had in the first place, where now the platform team is writing some templates and handing it over to the application teams to run and operate it. So we're still going to have all the pains we had in that world, um, and it doesn't really necessarily solve it. So what you really want is the best of all of these four scenarios. You want a platform that is customized for your organization, so the platform team can put in their organizational needs into the requests. You want it to be on-demand and self-service. I want to be able, as an application team, get what I need when I want it. I want to be able to, to consume it via a clean and consistent API. Um, and I want what I consume to be through a high-level API. You know, a lot of people don't want to say, I want a Redis, and here's the configuration for that Redis. They might just say, just give me a Redis. I don't really care how it's configured. So this has led to, so in order to have all of these four together, what we think you need, and a lot of people are talking about nowadays, is a platform API. So this is a single API that your platform team will build and manage, um, that your application teams can then go to to consume these services. So the application team can come to this platform API and say, hey, I need a Postgres, make an API call to the platform, and then the platform can go about fulfilling that request. Now, you might say this sounds all really good and easy, but there's a reason people aren't doing this, because it's quite difficult, and that's true, which is why at Syntasa we work on a framework called Kratix, which is a framework for building uh, platforms, and um, we think that this makes it easier to achieve these four goals. So I'm going to hand it over to Winner, who's going to talk through a demo of using Kratix. Thanks, Jake. So um, we're going to show a quick demo of Kratix and a platform API and how to get off the ground quickly. We have um, a organization that I'm going to work an example through with you. Um, and in this organization, we do have a platform team and we have application teams. And one of these application teams has come to the platform team and said, help, I have an application to deploy, but um, I need to decide about serving. I have some data requirements and I need to make sure that I can manage cash. And so in this organization, uh, working together with the platform team, they land on Nginx uh, for the serving. They um, enable Postgres, and they uh, decide on Redis for cache. Now, using Kratix as a framework and a foundation for that platform API, you take the services that your application teams are needing, and you encapsulate them in what we call a promise. So a promise is taking that service, bundling it together, and saying, I promise you um, that if you request it, the platform will provide you these services. So in this case, if you have an application team that needs these three services, then these Kratix promises could deliver those services once the requests come into the platform API. Um, but as we talked about in terms of value and reducing cognitive load, as a platform team with Kratix, we can go uh, sort of one step further, where we say, actually, what you need is an environment, much less than you need those individual bits. And how can we enable you more quickly to go from nothing to actually having a running environment where each of those three pieces is wired together and includes any business context you may have and is operational? So instead of making three individual requests that then get returned and have to be wired together, Kratix allows you to define a higher level promise that includes those lower level concerns and how to configure each one uh, respectively. So if we think about modern application teams, though, they're not just going to have one environment. They're going to have two to many. Um, for example, a development environment and a production environment. And so you could write a development promise, and you could write a uh, production uh, promise, and you could have the teams make requests for those, um, or you can take it one step further. So in addition to environments, teams for that full development lifecycle will need tools around observing the system once they start putting the system in place, and tools around automating the stuff that they don't care about because they want to ship features and focus on customers. So you can author observability promise, which includes um, metrics and dashboards. You can author um, pipeline promise, and you can swap in any, any sort of technologies here uh, that seem appropriate for the organization. You can take that higher level idea and say, actually, 
you need a full app as a service. So with a single request, an application team can ask the platform API for an application as a service, and they would then get back um, access to a development environment configured and ready to go production environment, and then either space or their own provisioned um, observability tools and pipelines. Um, so the other element to many platform engineering uh, teams in organizations is that they have their customers, the application teams, which they want to keep happy, and they want to keep um, making sure that they adopt the platform and use it over time. But they also have many, many stakeholders, and those stakeholders have uh, very important concerns for the business. And what we've seen is that um, sort of off-the-shelf platform tools tend to make it very, very difficult to insinuate business requirements into the offerings that you're giving your teams. And so uh, at, with Credix, we take the approach that every promise needs to have the capability to uh, define and integrate business requirements. So in this organization, they've landed on consolidated secrets management through uh, a shared vault where teams get namespaced uh, spots for their applications. Um, and they've also, as an early step in their compliance, they uh, trigger a Slack notification when an environment is requested. So again, this pipeline enables the sort of full business to have higher trust and confidence that the applications that are being deployed are deployed the right way uh, in the safest way possible. So now we're going to attempt a demo. Uh, we're going to be running uh, multi-cluster Kubernetes local on my machine using um, a Kind in Docker. So pairing this app as a service promise down a bit, uh, it's going to trigger a Slack notification when the request comes in. And it's also going to uh, create instances of uh, Nginx, um, Postgres, and Redis to deploy an application that the application team has defined. So let's see how this goes. So again, this is what we're going to be um, deploying. So we have, uh, I've set up some clusters. We have a platform cluster, which is where the platform API will live. And then we have a worker cluster, which is where those workloads that the platform uh, requests will be created. And right now, as I mentioned, Cradix is based on the concept of promises. So the platform is built up of promise offerings. Right now, hopefully no surprise, we don't have any. This is a fresh, fresh system. But uh, when you define your promise YAML, you apply it to the platform in a very Kubernetes native way that shouldn't really surprise anybody. Um, and when you apply it, then Cradix and the platform understand what you're trying to offer, and they then register that new promise. Earlier we spoke about those lower level promises building up to that higher level experience. And so if we do another request after a minute, what you'll see is that actually those lower level promises, if you choose, and in this case we did, um, can be exposed as additional promises. So that escape hatch for teams that don't want all out, all in one, um, but instead they just want an Nginx or they just want a Redis, um, Cradix makes it easy to have those lower level promises exposed as well. So we have, all of the, um, we have all of the promises installed. We have the CRD ready. So when that application team goes to request their app as a service, the um, platform is ready. And so um, speaking of the request, so Cradix has the concept of a resource request, which again is very familiar for Kubernetes folks. Um, Resource requests in Cradix can be as simple or as complicated as you want them to be. We tend to err on the side of simplicity because we want, again, to reduce the cognitive load. And in this um, scenario, what we're saying is that the application teams need to tell us a name, and they need to tell us where their um, application code lives, and then we have exposed um, database functionality. And really, the reason you have that sort of lower level question there is so that in the future, your pipeline can switch on what database you want, depending on what the request comes in for. So right now, we are configured to give Postgres every time. But it's fairly straightforward to do a switch and then offer uh, MySQL instead of Postgres for example, or to offer different offerings depending on um, the en environment and the team. So again, applying the resource request straight to the platform, and we can see that 
Kubernetes and Cradix understands that request because we can see the resource is now pending once the request comes in. And for um, resource requests, again, as I said, when I mentioned the pipeline and in general with those lower level promises, as soon as a resource request comes in, the promise pipeline kicks off. So if we look at the pods on the platform, it's a bit hard to read, I apologize, but you will see that there is a request pipeline defined for each one of the promises, the higher level and each of those lower level. And so if I flip back to the slides for just a second, um, I'll show you that the request came into the platform as that single request, and then internally what happens is the pipeline runs, um, there's a Slack notification that we'll check for in a minute, and then um, additional requests for the lower level promises get created and dumped into a GitOps repository. That repository is, of course, being syncing as well to your workload worker clusters, um, and uh, that's how the, the system works at a really high level. So if we go back to our demo um, and look at our worker cluster now, you can see that we have all of the services that the application team requested. So up and running, we have a Postgres, we have Nginx, we have down at the bottom the actual to-do application, um, very high customer value here. And we, you'll see some operators as well. We won't get into that today, but that's part of installing the promise, is enabling those worker clusters to have the resources it needs at installation time to be able to fulfill the requests that come in. So now theoretically, um, I have a hint to help me remember where this uh, application is. And if we click into the browser, we will see a to-do application. And this application is wired up with persistence and ready to go. So at a really high level, that is um, a very simple um, demo with Cradix. And now uh, Jake is going to talk a little bit more about what Cradix can do. Awesome. Thank you, Wendell. <clears throat> So uh, the first thing I want to talk about is multi-cluster scheduling. So um, we talked about this promise as a whole having lots of different components. We talked about it needing CI, CD, observability, and obviously the different services that you need across your different environments. Um, most companies nowadays are doing multi-cluster. Multi there are loads of great reasons why you'd want to separate out stuff across clusters. Maybe it's security concerns. You don't want certain applications both co-located on the same clusters. Maybe it's uh, concerns around availability. You know, if a particular AZ in the cloud goes down, you want to make sure that your application is still working, so you might deploy it across different regions or different avail availability zones. And just overall, um, most people we talk to nowadays are all aboard doing multiple multi-cluster Kubernetes. So if we take a look at what we might, what might be a reasonable layout for the stack that we talked about so far. So you can imagine that you want one centralized set of observability tools, like you want one place where you can go for your Grafana and your CI/CD. So like on the platform cluster, for example. And then you want your uh, individual, individual dev and prod environments spread out across different clusters. You don't want to co-locate them on the same cluster. So doing this in Cratix is quite easy. So Cratix has this concept of clusters. And when you register a cluster of Cratix, you give it some labels to describe what is this cluster for. So in this example, we have three clusters. We have a platform cluster, a dev cluster, and a prod cluster. And they're all labeled with that environment tag associating them. And then, um, because these are just labels, you can use as many labels as you want. So for example, for the production cluster, you might add the PCI equals true uh, label. And what happens is, like when I mentioned earlier, when a pipeline fires off, it's the pipeline's opportunity to decide, based upon the inputs, where should I schedule this workload? Um, so it might be, for example, uh, it, it could be that your resource request says it as an argument, like dev or prod, in which case you know, OK, when I output these resources, I'm going to tell Cratix only schedule it to clusters labeled dev or labeled prod. Um, it could also be much lower level. It could be that they happen to ask for Postgres. Therefore, you need to know that you need to use a cluster that has um, uh, data volumes configured to have like backups enabled. So maybe you would add a label to one of your clusters to say, hey, this cluster is a dev cluster, but it's also got um, backups enabled. So you might do like backups true or, or something. And so you, the power of it is that you can have whatever label you need for your context. So it could be. Also, that maybe you're just adding team labels. So you might have a particular cluster per team, in which case it might be env is dev, and it might also be team A as another label. Um, but Cratix is all around making it easy to schedule workloads to various different clusters. 
Um, so we talked about a lot of promises today. Um, there's a lot of software here, Nginx, Postgres, Redis, uh, Prometheus. Um, so the prospect of taking all of this and then converting it to promises and using it in Kratix might sound a bit daunting. Um, but we've been working on a marketplace of promises. So if you go to kratix.io slash marketplaces, this just links to an open source GitHub repository where all these promises exist. This is all um, Apache 2 open source. Um, the marketplace consists of a bunch of problems that we've written, as well as with some we have contributed back from the community. Um, so, for example, Maurizio here from the Dapper community contributed a Dapper promise to the marketplace. Um, and we're always looking for new contributors as well. Um, it's just a great place to go and enable you to get started very quickly with Kratix and promises. Um, so, as Winner did in the demo, we made a resource request to the platform using a Kubernetes manifest. and. Within your organization, your application teams might be used to this. They might be really familiar with, with Kubernetes and writing YAML, in which case this process might seem really easy for them. You might have other teams in your organization that don't use Kubernetes or just really hate writing YAML. Um, and the power of Kratix is that because it's just using the Kubernetes API under the hood, anything that you can use as a front end for Kubernetes, you can use for Kratix. So for example, Backstage is a really popular way of uh, writing, building platforms and integrating with um, Kubernetes. And Kratix comes out. Kratix has support for Backstage built into it, and we have a great blog on our website if you want to check it out of how to use it. But really, anything at all can be used as a way of integrating on top of Kratix, because it's all just the Kubernetes API under the hood. Um, and lastly, I want to talk about composability again. So like Winner mentioned, um, when we take this sort of bigger app-as-a-service promise, these are all individual promises underneath it. And we could see that in the uh, demo that she did. But it might be that different teams have different requirements. So uh, I can imagine a world in which all the teams need CI, CD, and dashboards, and they want to make sure they're using Vault and that they're doing all the things that their business needs need. But they might have different requirements for databases or for serving or for caches. And because these are all made up, all the promises are made up of lower level promises, it's really easy to just take one of the promises and swap it out for a different one. And because of pipelines, you can put the logic in there. So you could say, oh, they've specified, they haven't specified for a Postgres, they said in MySQL, I'm just going to swap out the promise that I'm making a resource call to. So it makes composing. Uh, sort of different experiences on Kratix, really easy. So what next? So if you are interested in Kratix and learning more, you can go to kratix.io. Um, we have a great set of docs and getting started guides. Um, and Kratix is also hosted on GitHub. It's an open source repository. We're always looking for feedback and contributions. PRs and issues are always welcome. Um, it's all open source, uh, patch 2.0 license. Um, and yeah, we'd love to love to have your thoughts on the product. And if you don't want to type links in, you can scan this QR code, and it will send you straight there. So yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jake and Minna. Any questions? Thought you. Um, thank you for the talk and nice solution. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, what you showed, you know, is basically uh, deploying the services inside Kubernetes. What about uh, managed service from the cloud providers? Do you have in your vision, like combining with something like cross-plane and also spinning up resources out of Kubernetes? That's a, a really great question. So um, that comes up a lot, and we actually have a blog on our website about using Kratix and cross-plane together. Because like you said, Crossplane is uh, a great open source tool for provisioning and managing resources in the cloud. And it actually fits in really nicely with Kratix. So just like we had uh, a shared CI CD, maybe you'll have a shared Crossplane instance that you'll use to provision and manage all your cloud services. So it just integrates together really nicely. Um, but even if you're not ready to use a tool like Crossplane, because every resource request runs a pipeline, you can put any logic in there that you need to. So maybe you want to run Terraform applies. Maybe you're using some other CLI to provision resources. You can just take what you have today put it in there, and it should just work. Thanks, Sheikh. Any other questions? Hey there. Uh, how do you implement a promise? That is a great question. Uh, so we have a lot of, without getting into too much detail right now, if you go to our doc site, we have sort of a, a set of references, but then we also have a set of guides. And the guides go from zero to writing a promise, writing multiple promises, changing promises. Um, we're working on building out a set of foundational promises in the marketplace, which you can 
fork and change as you need for your business context. But the steps for writing the pieces that are required for that promise definition are in the guides on our, um, on our docs. We essentially um, define a few high-level properties that Craddix looks for internally to be able to do the Kubernetes registering under the hood, to be able to understand the pipeline, to be able to, um, at this point, it's a, it's a fairly simple API at every level, um, and you just have to follow through and make sure you've, you've got the pieces that you need. Thanks, Vina. Maybe as a follow-up on the previous question, uh, let's say I don't want to run a uh, Kafka cluster for every customer or every attend whatever is on the running on the Kubernetes. So could I make a promise that sort of adds a new whatever, something, a host, or an, an instance uh, or, or a new queue or whatever. So not a complete new Kafka yep. cluster. Would that be possible? Yeah, so is that question around like slices versus pies? So don't want to get a whole new database, but give me a slice of that database that's already existing. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, so that's um, one of the core ways we see application teams and organizations accessing things, whether it's a shared vault instance that's across the organization or queues in a, in a shared Kafka. Um, yeah, there are ways to do that. Thanks, Mina. Any other questions? Thanks so much, Jake and Mina. Thank you. Thank you.